Cannibalism. You either love it or hate it. It's not the most popular type of cuisine, but has a dedicated following. Contrary to popular opinion, that following is not limited to Germany. All over the world, there have been cases of cannibalism whose notoriety stained history. In 1820, an English ship sank after it crashed into a sperm whale. That alone is crazy. But it took a darker turn when the now stranded survivors resorted to eating the flesh of their dead comrades. At the moment of their rescue, two of them were seen with human bones in their mouths. This event inspired the story of Moby Dick, which I don't remember as being cannibal heavy, but to be honest, I slept through most of the movie. Personally, I've never been a fan of cannibalism, but it seems like an acquired taste. After all, there are many different cases of human beings eating each other. It can't be that bad. In 1640, Dutch explorer Abel Tasman became the first European to see New Zealand with his own eyes. She was unlike other newly discovered lands in that her natives themselves had not been there long. It's thought New Zealand was first settled by humans in the 13th century. The descendants of those initial settlers came to be known as Maori, with their own unique warrior culture. By 1500, they had driven the male bird to extinction, which at first sounds rude, but it was a flightless bird and therefore had no purpose or reason to be kept alive. Flightless birds are a vile menace, and these flightless birds were massive. Their annihilation gave a brief glimpse of Maori battle potential. By the early 1800s, the British Empire was starting to colonise New Zealand, having seen Australia recently fall into its hands. But Maori natives didn't always give Europeans a warm reception. In October of 1809, a British convict ship arrived in New Zealand. Around 70 people were on board. Some were prisoners, others civilians or commissioned sailors. But one passenger was unique. He was Te Ara, son of a respected Maori chief. Somehow, he had come into British service as a sailor. For the last year, he had worked as and was treated the same as other sailors, even being whipped on occasion. But he was the son of a chief. In his culture, he would never be treated this way. Te Ara wanted revenge, just as his people would expect of him. He talked the captain into entering the waters of his homeland, saying it would be a good region to resupply. On contacting his tribe, they started planning revenge for his disrespect at British hands. Three days later, the ship's captain was lured away from his vessel along with four others. They assumed natives would not dare attack British officers, but they did, slaughtering them as soon as their canoes were far enough away for his crew to not notice. And this was just the start. The now dead had their clothes taken so that the Maori could disguise themselves as British. They climbed into the captain's boat in disguise and approached the main ship without causing alarm. Their ridiculous comic book revenge plot had so far been successful. After nightfall, they climbed aboard, with many other Maori waiting in canoes on the waters below. That night, they massacred all those they found on board. They clubbed and stabbed and strangled even civilians to death, then ransacked and set fire to the ship. Corpses of the dead were taken to the shore and eaten. After feasting on the flesh of their enemy, corpses were thrown into a pile that would later be discovered by horrified Englishmen. Just four on board the ship that night survived the massacre. A cabin boy and a woman with two children. They were soon rescued and on reaching safety told their story. A story that would go down in history as one of cannibalism's greatest hits. Around 66 people were killed and eaten, making it one of the largest cases of cannibalism on record. I forget the point I was going to make by telling you this story. Something about how cannibalism isn't that bad, but now having told it out loud, it does sound quite bad. So yeah, I think this next case will be more uplifting. According to some reports, US President Andrew Jackson once had over a thousand natives killed, before sleeping in a field of corpses and eating the flesh of 12 natives. But those reports are probably false. They were published in a series of anti-Jacksonian propaganda pieces, thus proving that cannibalism isn't that bad. In the 1500s, Central Europe saw countless witch trials. They had a simple structure. Women were accused of witchcraft, tortured into confession, and swiftly executed. The screams of accused witches can still be heard echoing through historical documents. But another type of trial is much lesser known. They are werewolf trials. 
The main difference between them is that werewolves don't exist, but that didn't stop dozens of men from being put through them. In the late 1500s, the tiny German town of Bedbury would on occasion see local children disappear, only to later be found dead, their corpses in pieces as if wolves had torn them apart. 18 corpses were found this way without any sign of the wolves responsible. After years of disappearances, the townsfolk set out to find them with hunting dogs. One day, the group was searching the area surrounding where the latest victim disappeared, when they spotted what appeared to be an abnormally large wolf. With caution, they followed it. While following, they witnessed it transform into a local man they recognised by the name of Peter Stump. He was well known, having lived in Bedbury all his life and practised black magic from a young age. Those allegations were now dwarfed by the claim he regularly transformed into a monster by use of a magic wolf pelt. Stump was paraded through the town and further accused of committing incest with his daughter, and cannibalising the resulting child. He was tied to a rack and stretched until making a very twisted confession. According to it, the devil gave him the magical pelt that would transform the wearer into a greedy, devouring wolf, strong and might, with eyes great and large that in the night sparkled like fire, a mouth great and wide with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. He also admitted killing men, women, children and livestock over a 25 year period. With this admission, Stump was tied to a wheel. Flesh was then pulled from his body with red hot pincers. His arms and legs were torn off and finally he was beheaded. They then flayed and strangled his daughter. I'm not sure what she did to deserve that, but it happened. What I'm about to say might be considered controversial. I feel that she didn't deserve to die like this. I also feel that her father probably wasn't a werewolf, but that doesn't mean he was innocent. Many historians believe Peter Stump was really a serial killer who took 18 lives in order to satisfy his hunger for human flesh. In short, that he really was a cannibal. The 16th century was a deeply superstitious era. Legends of him being a werewolf may have been constructed around reality, as a way of understanding cannibalism. Three centuries later, when superstition played less of a role in criminal justice, a much different trial would set the legal precedent for cases of cannibalism. In 1884, a ship bound for Australia left its home port in England. I call it a ship. It was really a 52-foot yacht called the Mianette. Being this size and with a crew of just four, it really had no business sailing this far. So two months into the journey, the Mianette sank, because that's what happens when you try and sail a Victorian yacht to literally the other side of the earth, even though it's flat. The shipwreck left her crew stranded in a tiny lifeboat in the middle of the sea. They hoped to catch seafood to keep them alive, and managed to catch a turtle. But the world's unluckiest turtle wasn't enough to keep them going. After 19 days, the situation was dire, and so like good Englishmen, they turned to cannibalism. The captain suggested they draw straws, and whoever picks the short straw be killed and eaten. But none of them were open to being cannibalised, so that didn't happen. The captain decided that if they were not rescued, by the next day he would eat the cabin boy, who was sick because the idiot drank seawater. With the 20th day rolling by and no sign of rescue, the captain stabbed him in the neck with a penknife. The three remaining men then began to consume his flesh. Four days later they were rescued by a German ship en route to Hamburg. Back in England, the captain and his first mate were put on trial for murder. Their trial remains among the most studied in law schools today. Rather uniquely, the defence was not attempting to challenge that it was a case of murder. They admitted killing the cabin boy. They instead claimed that the murder was justified out of necessity, that they needed to kill him in order to survive themselves. But the judge GTFO'd that argument, drawing distinction between self-defence and what they did. Both men were sentenced to death, setting the precedent for legal cases involving this kind of murder and cannibalism. The case received massive attention in Victorian England, partly due to its grisly nature. Many were sympathetic to the defendants, believing their cannibalism was justifiable. Most importantly, one of the court officials involved was called Lord Bacon. But the case also had a much more enigmatic element. Several decades before this, Edgar Allan Poe published the only novel he ever wrote, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. It tells the story of a young man who stows away aboard a whaling ship, but that ship sank, leaving survivors stranded on a much smaller craft, just like the real case 46 years later. 
They manage to catch a turtle just like in real life, but it's not enough. They eventually draw straws to determine who will be killed and eaten. A young survivor pulls the short straw and is stabbed to death and eaten. Days later, those who cannibalized him were rescued just like in real life. The story and real disaster are almost identical. But the strangest part is that the character who in the story was killed and eaten was called Richard Parker. The exact same name as the man killed and eaten in real life. Some do, just as many Victorians of the time did, believe Poe's novel to be evidence of time travel. And if that's true, cannibalism can't be that bad.